So, um, good morning. My name is Rachel Berlinski and I'm the operations manager of Oak Park River Forest Museum. Um, I don't think you can see me, but you can see today's presenter, Alan Hofstetter. Um, today, he will be talking about uh, a mysterious figure, I would say, in Oak Park history, especially. Um, this is a person that you may have seen on the wall if you visit uh, Oak Park Village Hall. And maybe you've said to yourself, who is this gentleman who's on the wall who I've never heard of, um, who is of some note? So today we will be learning about Bernard Fantis, Dr. Bernard Fantis, and why he is of note. And uh, without further delay, I will pass this presentation off to Alan Hofstetter. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am indeed Alan Hofstetter. I am a retired blood banker, and I owe Bernard Fantis my career. The whole premise behind doing this today comes from the fact that I went into the Village Hall a few years back to do what citizens have to do at Village Hall. And while standing in line, I noted all of the, uh, uh, the personages that had been honored on the wall and thought, why not Bernard Fantas? He lived here 20 years. He died here. He was world famous in his time. Why don't we own him? This is the picture of Bernard that is what you will find on the internet no matter where you go. Uh, it's the classical one of him standing with all of his books in his briefcase behind his beloved Cook County Hospital of Chicago. The picture I would have had put on the wall if the village had asked me is to the right. I want, I want to uh, acknowledge before I begin uh, the family of uh, Muriel Fantas, Muriel Fantas Fulton. Uh, who allowed me the access to her uncle's uh, collection at the University of Chicago. Now, it's not as if transfusion wasn't taking place in the world. It was. Uh, but transfusion, which has a 350-year uh, history, uh, began in, in grotesque ways. Uh, they were transfusing blood from animal to animal. They were transfusing blood from animal to man and man to man. But the difficulty was always clotting and uh, the fact that it just couldn't be transferred for any length of time. Uh, there is a whole history between 1667 and where I will begin the story, uh, but that is for a, another time. Bernard was born into relative poverty in Budapest, Hungary in 1874. He was born to David and Ida Fantas, and the Fantas family consisted of four brothers, and Bernard was the one who wanted to become a physician. And his parents were very much supportive of that, but that was not likely to happen in the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, because of certain elements of religious persecution and getting an education at that time. So the Fantas family emigrated to America uh, by a circuitous route through Germany and Holland and the United Kingdom and Canada and finally ending up in Detroit. All four brothers eventually established families in the United States, but Bernard wanted to become a physician. And while in Detroit, his father apprenticed him to a local pharmacist, explaining that if he knew a great deal about the therapeutics of the time, the materia medica of the time that might help him in medical school, I assure you that pharmacies of that time were not anything like pharmacies of today. Everything was made by hand, which is why the symbol of pharmacy is a mortar and a pestle. Uh, Bernard had to know all kinds of chemicals in order to mix them in the right uh, proportions to ensure that his patients were safe. He sat for the examination of the Michigan Board of Pharmacy and managed to become a registered pharmacist in the state of Michigan and became a registered pharmacist in the state of Illinois, which was helpful to him later on. Um, he was accepted to medical school. Medical school at that time, as you can see, was somewhat different than it is now. Uh, here is a, a, a hall with uh, famous professors at the front presenting patients. And you'll note that they're all men and you'll note that there isn't a single element of protective uh, gear 
on any one of them. The only one who looks to me to be very safe is the nurse at the center. Bernard went to the uh, College of uh, uh, Physicians and Surgeons of the University of Illinois uh, in the late 1800s. Uh, he was notably uh, one of the finest students of his class. Uh, he is seen here in the lower right uh, doing uh, uh, gross anatomy with his colleagues, Dr. Tekin and Dr. Frank. While he was in medical school, because the family really didn't have very much money, he continued to work as a pharmacist to earn money for tuition. His father had a printing firm, and that printing firm he used to exchange tuition fees with printed materials for the University of Illinois. But Bernard was also brilliant. So he got scholarships, he won medals. By the time he graduated from medical school in 1899, he was actually teaching at the medical school because he was one of very few people who had a background in pharmacology. About the same time as he graduated, this event occurred. Dr. Karl Landsteiner, uh, an obscure Viennese physician in, uh, in Austria, um, discovered the blood groups, 1900. This would make transfusion later much safer. Uh, the world did not honor Dr. Landsteiner until 1930. The place that Bernard wanted to go was Cook County Hospital after he graduated. Cook County Hospital of Chicago was the mecca for anyone who wanted to become a really fine physician. This is actually what the Cook County Hospital looked like uh, in 1876 when it was established as a, as a large complex. Uh, those of us who live in the city of Chicago would not have recognized this because we are familiar with the, uh, the newer version of it. Dr. Fantas became a member of the uh, staff uh, in the early 1900s and established himself uh, as a very hard worker and researcher, and he did extraordinary things in his first 10 years as a, uh, an attending physician. He wanted to be at county because he was a man who believed in doing good just for the sake of doing good. The county hospital was more or less the Ellis Island uh, for uh, the indigent in the city of Chicago. You're looking at the war, one of the wards of Cook County Hospital in the upper left, and there were at least 40, sometimes 50 patients in each ward. When I was at County Hospital, these wards still existed, only separated by curtains. He was fortunate enough to meet quite a number of nurses, and he met and fell in love with Emily Sen. And in 1904, they were married and very cleverly, he married her on his birthday, so he would never forget his anniversary. This is the county hospital um, that was built in 1916 and opened then. Again, the wards were the same. Uh, this is the building uh, a few years back. Uh, massive structure, Beaux-Arts architecture. I want to call your attention to just a couple of things. Number one, this and this over here are the amphitheaters that you saw where all the men were sitting in rows. These are the operating room suites. They are painted in this photograph, but originally they were all glass because natural light was used for surgery. Now, Dr. Fantas actually had made a name for himself in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. And he uh, was so famous uh, that when he began getting angry about something, people listened. The Food and Drug Act of, uh, of 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act, uh, um, limited remedies that we would call snake oil today. Uh, these patent medicines that were not tested by anybody because the Food and Drug Administration did not exist at that time. Um, he was incensed because the kinds of patent medicines that were created then contained narcotics, codeine and uh, co cocaine and heroin, uh, opium, and these baby soothers that were sold to mothers who were frantic about their colicky children, unfortunately caused the babies to never wake up again. 
uh, I found an interesting uh, cartoon about uh, Dr. Fantas, uh, likening him to Kerry Nation, who was the uh, teetotaler and prohibitionist who used to break open uh, barrels of beer with her ax. And as you see, she has suggested that he take an ax to what were called pharmacies in those days and were not really anything but uh, sales centers for nostrums. And the sales, it was a hundred million dollar business per year. This is the Chicago Tribune from approximately 1912. And you'll notice it says, Dr. Bernard Fantas accuses newspapers of complicity in killing of infants through cures. His name is at the top of the column. That's how well known he was known in the United States. The Tribune published this article about all the other newspapers that were taking money from the Nostrum industry because they took no money from them. They were pure. He was so famous, by the way, that, that when he adopted his child, uh, Ruth, uh, it was actually published in the newspaper. His name could be lent to anything at that time. I think I would be doing him a disservice to say he was the Dr. Oz of his time, but he was that well known in the United States of America. This is a, col this is a column ad from the uh, American Medical Association's journal in which there's a small box that says, Dr. Fantas says. They wanted his name to, to add to authenticity uh, and to the purity, whatever products they were making, because his imprimatur was very important for their sales. What's interesting about him is he was so knowledgeable about materia medica, about pharmacology, about all of medicine, that by the mid 1930s, he was the editor of the Merck Manual. Anyone online who was a physician would know this. This is the Bible of medicine that every young medical student gets when they graduate and carries around with them in their, in their little black bag, as if anybody today were still, still, still carrying a little black bag. Um, articles from the Journal of the American Medical Association were printed in small pamphlets. And this is a pamphlet from 1916 that also gave Dr. Fantas a great deal of fame. He was the creator of the concept of candy medication. All of the stuff he ever processed as a pharmacist would be considered vile tasting. And he just felt he could not get medication to children unless he flavored it. And the fact that he was creating this idea uh, got him in the newspapers at the time because of his fame, um, even into columns that were common like Dr. Uh, William Augustus Evans, who was a well-known public health physician uh, of that time. He was also adamant against prescription writing in Latin. He decided that this was a foolish way to, to prepare medications. Uh, he thought it was uh, stifling to originality and uh, he fought for a long time. And you will find that there's very little now in prescriptions that uses the Latin language. War tends to be the impetus for advances in medicine. The Great War began, and that was, of course, what we now call World War I. And one of the other fathers of the blood bank was Acton, British-born physician who was an American by this time, was a captain in the U.S. Army in France. It was Oswald H. Robertson, Oswald Hope Robertson. He was taking blood from people at the, uh, behind the lines, and he was bottling it in sterile bottles in a little kit that he carried around with him and thus began transfusion indirectly uh, at, the, uh, at the front. It is worth noting that Dr. Oswald Hope Robertson ended up at the University of Chicago and was a consultant to Dr. Fantas when he was building his blood bank. Uh, Dr. Fantas also believed in prohibition and was an active fighter for the law that took place in 1919 or 1920. His wife, Emily, decided that uh, living and working in the medical center area was just too much for him and that he needed to find a place for respite. And she encouraged him to buy a house in the village of Oak Park, which is why we can claim him. The house at the left is the one he bought in 1920. And this is the way it looks today. I missed the balcony. He was instrumental in trying to create something called the Medical Park. The area around the Cook County Hospital, the University of Illinois, and the Rush Medical Center were all basically slums, dreadful, dirty, smoky places 
that did not uh, aid people in gaining um, uh, better health. And he worked assiduously in the 1930s to try to develop the Illinois Medical District in such a way that it would contain a convalescent park. Uh, by the way, that is why this small article uh, I've included because he was very busy in doing this and he became famous in circles that he wasn't famous in before. This is an example of of some of the mapping that they were doing at the time to try to control the way the medical center was uh, was growing and to give it its park. But unfortunately, Dr. Fantas wasn't necessarily successful in doing that. This is all that is left of his dream. This is the convalescent park called Pasteur Park. This is right in front of the current Cook County Hospital uh, Hotel, the Hyatt, that it has become. Um, it contains a few trees, a statue of Dr. Pasteur, and of course, there's the Congress Expressway of the time, now the uh, Eisenhower uh, in front of it. All that it was used for was to land helicopters. He was also uh, an avid fighter against uh, ragweed pollen. And um, Dr. Evans put out a pamphlet on this. They were trying to rid the city of this uh, pest and what Dr. Fantas did in the 1930s was to use the Works Progress Administration to get crews out all over the city to pull up every plant of ragweed that was there. Unfortunately, the ragweed was being blown in from off the plains and the work did not help. Now, they wanted, they, the people who surrounded Dr. Fantas and uh, influenced him and he influenced, uh, always wanted his name lent to things. This is a pamphlet from the, uh, uh, the Carbonated Beverages Association. He gave an address on it because carbonated water was safe. It was good for your digestion. It was sterile in its bottles. It was a good form of potable water, which in the United States was not necessarily available at the time. The only reason I put this here is that I became disturbed by the fact that he considers it perhaps a good way to have a reducing diet. It's only 100 calories per bottle and it gives you good nutrition and it's good for your stomach. And I have a feeling that Dr. Fantas may have been responsible for the obesity epidemic in the United States today. Um, he didn't necessarily subscribe to any particular religion, although he himself was born Jewish, but he was definitely a humanist. He signed the Humanist Manifesto of 1933, one of the famous signatories. War tends to be the impetus for advances in medicine. Again, this slide appears. And again, war presents the ability to transfuse. In the Spanish Civil War, again, people were trying to transfer blood from one person to another without doing it necessarily directly. Uh, direct transfusion was common from the late 1800s all the way up to Dr. Fantas's establishment of the blood bank. You ran the, uh, the, the you sat the donor next to the recipient and you transfuse blood from one to another with a syringe. Dr. Fantas thought, let's use the, 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 what we've learned from Dr. Robertson in World War I and what we've learned from the Spanish Civil War front and put blood into sterile bottles that we can store for some length of time, indirect transfusion. And then he built uh, holsters of some kind for these Erwin Meyer flasks so you'd be able to transfuse patients easily. What he did was to um, uh, lobby the Cook County Board of Commissioners to buy a restaurant style refrigerator so he could store this precious blood. It is worth noting that when I call him the father of blood banking, we can call him the father. We can call Dr. Robertson the father. There's a fellow who developed the American National Red Cross, Charles Richard Drew. Uh, success has many fathers. But one of the things that's important about what he did was he took scientific principles of storage and he decided to provide a codification of everything, practical guidelines for managing it and distributing it. And because he was able to do that, um, he uh, 
published in the Journal of the American Medical Association what they now call a landmark article on July 10th, about three months after his blood bank experiment became started. It just so happened, coincidentally, that Dr. Fantas was so knowledgeable and so famous that he had his own column in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Let's talk just for a few seconds about the concept of the blood bank. He called it a blood bank because you needed to deposit blood in the bank to call for blood from the bank. Each ward had a debit and credit um, file uh, in the blood bank and uh, your balances were kept. And if you wanted to perform surgery as a physician, you would have to provide blood from a patient's family or perhaps from the um, uh, um, um, interns and residents themselves. These are not slides to read. These are slides to savor if you can go and see this uh, on the YouTube. He was a very active physician. He was very famous. He was asked to do everything by everybody, and his name was known everywhere in the United States of America. The last act of Dr. Fantas was for the AMA, the American Medical Association. He was sent on a tour to look at spas and health resorts in the United States and set standards, whereupon he had a heart attack and had to be sent home. He went upstairs to his bedroom and he never came back downstairs. He was there for over a year. The blood bank, which had been constructed and was operating three years now, by the time this birthday card got there, was signed by all the members of the blood bank, including its director, Elizabeth Shermer. The first director of the blood bank was a female physician. Uh, it's signed here by the first blood bank technologist, uh, Siegfried Red Moynikin. Uh, Peter, his son, uh, lives in the village. He succumbed in April 1940 and is buried in Forest Park. And just to finish it out, Dr. Fantas' work came at a good time. World War II began. And pretty much the establishment of the blood bank and the concepts and the codification of how it should operate was used by the Allied forces to save so many of its uh, military. By the late 1940s, there were bottles that were manufactured for storing blood. You went out and bought yourself a Frigidaire and you were in the blood bank business. Dr. Fantas was honored in 1940 with a, uh, a clinic that was named after him that was only recently torn down in, in the uh, uh, process of uh, revitalizing uh, the medical center. I noticed this in the newspaper some years back. The business section of the Tribune was doing inventions that changed everything. And there is Dr. Fantas sandwiched between the wireless remote and the birth control pill. Blood bank still exists. It is in the basement of the new Cook County Hospital. He might not recognize it except maybe for the boxes that Dr. Robertson would have used as ammunition boxes with ice in them to store blood. He would see his beloved refrigerators but pretty much everything in the blood bank is now automated, it's in plastic, and thanks to him, millions of transfusions take place every year. There is a plaque at the Cook County Hospital uh, dedicated to him, and it was this plaque that I saw in 1972 that sent me on this track of looking up and finding about the work of Dr. Fanta. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. Forgive me for having spoken so quickly. It's too much for a small period of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Alan. Um, it's really incredible to think about, well, to be able to honor this man's work and think about all of the things that Dr. Fantas had a hand in that we definitely take for granted today. So um, I want to invite everyone on the call today, if you have questions for um, our presenter, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I will take a minute to say that you, you um, showed a slide of Dr. Fantas's uh, grave marker in Forest Home Cemetery. And I will plug an event that we have coming up at the end of next month. Um, August 26th or 29th, the last Sunday in August, we will be having a walking tour um, on the west side of Forest Home Cemetery, which is a little bit different of an area than we usually feature on our um, 
Tale of the Tombstones walking tour. And so on the last Sunday, we will be touring some different um, people who are buried in the west end of Forest Home, uh, including Dr. Fantis. So you will hear about him a little bit again. And all of you people on the call today will know so much more about him than we will be able to cover on that tour, but you'll see a lot of other people that day as well. So um, sign up for that on our website. It's oprfmuseum.org. And um, it looks like we have a question. We want to take a look at that. Well, I can answer Peggy. Uh, I am a uh, proud graduate of the Chicago Public School System and attended Nicholas Sen High School. Uh, I did not find a connection between the Nicholas Sen and the Sen family, mm -hmm. uh, although I'm interested in trying to find that. Okay. So our question was, was Emily Sen related to Dr. Nicholas And I Sen? just don't know. Um, and who is Dr. Sen? Oh, it's not. And who Dr. is Emily Sen? Emily Sen was Emily Fantas. Oh. He was Dr. She was Dr. Fantas's wife. Okay, fantastic. Well, it looks like those are some questions here. Um, I think unless everybody... Unless anybody else has a quick question for Alan Hofstetter, I think we will sign off for today. And um, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us and um, being able to highlight the work of Dr. Fantis. And um, yeah, so uh, I will sign off for today and invite you all to um, attend our next virtual programs. We have them twice a month. So again, uh, see our website, oprfmuseum.org. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you.